Yeah, nothing will happen. That's uh, yeah. yeah. All of us from different world, you know, different part of the world made it. Yeah. So this was a big demo for the collaboration, right? For the teamwork. Yeah. Okay. We need to continue for the teamwork. Yeah. So yeah, I think okay, Robert. Yeah. So give you the chance. Let you lovely kiss. Show his face. <laughs> Is he around here? <laughs> okay. My kids, no, they're 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 uh, actually oh, okay. no, they're, okay. they're gone somewhere else. Yeah. Good. Okay. I, yeah. <laughs> Great. So yeah, we move on. Yeah, we are right on time. I think yeah, Miso. Now it's uh, your time to introduce Professor Philip. Yeah, we go to her a last story from Philip. Okay, <laughs> stage is yours. Okay. Yeah, I I have to say sorry to um, Robert first because I think this is the highlight of the tonight uh, for me in Korea tonight and in the morning. So I'm so honored. My name is Misu Kim. I'm so honored to introduce Professor Philip Kim at Harvard University as I'm one of his big admirer, admirers and a big fan of his work, uh, even though he doesn't know that. But <laughs> and um, if I may share his biography here as he gave, um, Professor Philip Kim received his bachelor's degrees in physics at Seoul National University and received his PhD in applied physics from Harvard University. And he was a Miller Postdoctor Fellow in Physics from University of California, Berkeley. And he then joined uh, the Department of Physics at Columbia University as a faculty member. And then since 2014, he moved to Harvard University where he's a professor of physics and applied physics. Professor Kim is well known for his seminar work in physics of low dimensional materials. And he published more than 200 papers in, in professional journals, well, which are all well cited. First of Kim um, also received numerous honors and awards, including um, so many lists here. <laughs> and I'd like to add one more thing that uh, when I introduced him um, to Alice, I, 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 I'm quoting my own sentences here. He's such a renowned and highly esteemed researcher with great achievement and great personality. He's uh, really famous all over the world and even he's a big star in Korea too. So I'm so honored to introduce him. And um, uh, Professor uh, Philip Kim, please share your wisdom for the world. And the, I, I'm quoting Alice, the stage is yours. <laughs> All right, yeah, Lisa, thank you very much for the nice introductions. And then it seems like you put a lot of pressure on me, so. <laughs> Oops, okay, uh, let's start. Okay, good, great, All right, thanks. Uh, thanks for every, everyone, and especially in China, in Korea, or East Asia, I think this is getting uh, late. And Friday night, I'm not sure that uh, the people will enjoy just kind of sitting into the, um, uh, the talk. So I decide uh, also uh, from Alice, uh, who actually graciously invited me with this great event. Um, uh, the, there are a lot of people then, I think this is probably uh, the, the largest talk that I ever give, the largest audience that I, I give a talk. So something like the, uh, several hundred thousands, I think that's kind of a lot of numbers. And I'm sure that not uh, uh, not all of, uh, all of the audiences are physicists and then uh, the proper background that uh, going to go through that esoteric physics stuff. So I just decided to make the, my presentation is a little bit more uh, introductory and that accessible and uh, try to explain that uh, the basic motivations behind of that. Um, so we'll see how it goes. Right. So uh, I'm just kind of trying to give you some background of the material system I'm working on. And uh, the, this particular material system is uh, the category of so-called the quantum matter. Uh, but in particular, it is uh, consists of the stacks of the atomic layer. And we try to look at this, some of the new functionalities, which might be useful for the, some applications, but also it could be very interesting for the object that we can just understand this scientifically. So that is the basic motivations. But let me start with um, a bit of the, uh, the background. I mentioned to you that uh, during this uh, the conversation before this talk, that uh, about this uh, silicon technologies. Indeed, uh, this uh, silicon technology has been around for us more than half of the centuries. And it has been really amazing. I think uh, the, uh, uh, the 
the level of the technological advance we achieve on this system is kind of really mind, mind, uh, mind boggling. Um, if you just look at the silicon chips inside, it's already kind of really, really complicated structures. I think if you just uh, zoom in and structures and zoom in to the structures, down to the really the core level, where which actually is consists of the, this, the, the transistors, already the number of the transistor in typical silicon chip is uh, tens of billion. I think it's become amazing numbers. And only just within about the centimeter scales of the, uh, the kind of area which means that each of the elements becomes now shrink down the level of the really some of the atomic length scale. I think some of the uh, critical length scale, such as the dielectric thicknesses that consist of the, the silicon uh, transistor is a length of the say tens of the atoms or tw uh, hundreds of atomic length scale, so-called what you call the nanometer length scale. So it is already kind of quantum mechanical object in some sense. And then uh, the, we know that how to tame or how to entail these structures into such a kind of small length scale, and nevertheless, still also kind of make the, the billions of them working out. I would say this is a really engineering model uh, that a human can achieve already in the technological scale. The one of the key of the this success of the semiconductor engineering, I would say, is the way that we can tame down to the, this, uh, the structures down to such a small length scale. Part of this, uh, this semiconductor technologies also is uh, related with the dealing with the structures in the atomic length scale. And one of the way that people have been demonstrating, indeed, one can grow the material by even just atomic layer by layer is what we often call this uh, molecular beam of text scale uh, the technologies. And this consists of the basically carefully, uh, careful evaporation of the um, atomic materials and make the, this the stackings onto the, this wafer scale. And in that way, you just kind of literally make the, this, the, the atomic layer one by one and kind of the compositions that you want kind of stack them together. So this technology that developed again many tens of the years ago uh, has been now widely used in some of the uh, semiconductor applications as well as the making devices, the quantum material structures. One can realize some of the interesting uh, device for the studies and application. It becomes a quantum mechanical, obviously. Part of the reason is it uses a reduced distance material down to the really atomic length scale where that the quantum mechanics really manifest themselves. Uh, so that's uh, the, uh, the current uh, state of art of the semiconductor uh, industry as well as the semiconductor research. What I want to add up uh, on the top of that is in probably about 10 years ago, uh, 15 years ago, that there is a new directions that one can achieve uh, to create uh, this uh, similar material structures, but quite different way. And that is uh, the topic that I'm going to share today, which is basically uh, 2D materials, or often we call the Van der Waals materials and their heterostructures. It comes out in the following way. Many of materials we know comes out the atomic layered structures. And often this atomic layered materials, what we call the Van der Waals materials, all the chemical bond is within the layer. And then they basically stack together to form this uh, three-dimensional structures. Because of this is the layered structures and weak Van der Waals interaction between them, in principle, you can just uh, take this material, cleave them or grow them layer by layer, as I just kind of mentioned in kind of previous sections. But you can also stack them together with the different compositions. Right? And the idea is by just combining this uh, layered system with all sorts of different uh, functionalities, say some of them becomes metal, semiconductors, magnetic materials and superconductors, can we combine them together to make this uh, yet stacked three-dimensional structures, but they have the different functionalities. Can we actually use them for different type of the devices? And more interestingly, can we just create uh, some of the interesting new physical properties in there? that we can study their the new uh, physical uh, the properties at the uh, appearing at the interfe uh, interface. So that is basic idea. Now, this is not only this cartoon we can draw, um, uh, has been actually demonstrated in, uh, in uh, probably about past decades uh, throughout the many collaborations uh, that why, what I have been involved in as well as uh, the worldwide efforts in other places. So the initial demonstration of those, those kind of this heterostructuring of the Van der Waals materials comes as a very simple way. Basically, using the scar tape, you just kind of uh, cleave them materials off down to the one single atomic layer. 
and then you just pick them up by again that using the polymer layers and just kind of stack them. Now this is uh, happening by just kind of uh, small manipula uh, manipulators with the uh, aid of the hands. Now this type of the process becomes more automatic, uh, automated and uh, one can now even produce uh, this type of uh, heterostructures uh, by more of the designing questions. But nevertheless, the idea is already captured in very initial work that just by using the scotch tape and manually stack them together. And here is a good example. Here that we cleave off the graphene, a single layer of the graphite uh, down to one monoatom layer. And we just can encapsulate with the boron nitride, which is kind of graphene like the materials, but it's insulator and form this atomic stacks out of it, right? In the middle of the this stack, so when you just cut it out, uh, uh, and show this the TM image. Graphene layer is here that encapsulate by this boron nitride. In a sense, uh, this is a very similar atomic stack so you saw in the MB type of techniques that developed the atomic stack in semiconductor, except that this was basically built by hand. But nevertheless, you already appreciate a very similar, uh, similar uh, the uh, flavor that we can make into the this atomic stack with the very simple techniques. It turns out, um, the, we can also make the contact onto the, this materials, so especially in principle, you can make the contact any of the disatomic layer that by will, right? For example, we just etch the, uh, this text very carefully and uh, except the graphene or this boron nitride insulator. So if you just put the metal uh, contact on the side, uh, we can make the, this contact on graphene and quickly this becomes uh, just the devices such as a field effect transistors or can demonstrate uh, some of the simple uh, field effective operation as a transistor out of it, right? But you can just imagine that we can just make a little bit more complicated structures out of it. Uh, for example, instead of graphene with the boron nitride, uh, we can just combine that with uh, some of the other type of atomic stacks. Here, the graphene uh, with the molid isulfide, which is in this case a semiconductor, again encapsulated by this HBN, that's again insulator. You can form this type of the stacks or the various different kind of properties. And they start to show the different type of the functional behavior that one can utilize for some of the device application. So this is a yet another kind of, kind of quick example that those kind of stacking atomic layer in principle can be done by the designing. And one can quickly come up with this uh, uh, complicated material structures, uh, uh, just, uh, just utilizing their kind of different properties. In fact, this type of the approaches can be easily extended into the much more complicated device structures. Now, uh, these are kind of a couple of different examples that, uh, that one can demonstrate it. Not only just the two or three layers, you can just combine four or five layers, 10 layers, and each of the, these layers, again, different type of the context can be made. You can start to see that uh, starting from the rather uh, small, uh, the simple structures, one can quickly build up the rather complicated structures uh, by just the designing. So after this uh, 10 or 15 years of the progress in the field, now one can come up with these uh, various different materials and various different combinations uh, make the, the rather complicated functional structures. So that's kind of the uh, status of the, the field at this point. I'm going to tell you that uh, based on this type of this assembling techniques and making devices, what actually we can study and what kind of useful, interesting devices we can form out of it. Let me start with the, some of this, uh, the grand visions uh, of this uh, the, the research goal. I'm showing you here, it's kind of simple table uh, that the, the column of the rows consists of the different materials. I chose kind of some of the materials and then of course, least of the material goes really, really long. But even this material that I chose is a, one of the rep representative materials. I already mentioned about the graphene, which is, uh, one of this, uh, the first kind of the 2D materials arrived in the world. Uh, and the HBN, which is insulator I mentioned. I also briefly mentioned on molded isulfide. This is what we call the transition metal dicharcoalginide uh, semiconductor. Uh, it's a long name, but uh, the, you can just view that this is two dimensional semiconductor that can exist down to the uh, monoatomy layer. There are many of the different of, uh, of them by just simply changing some compositions, say moly to the tungsten, uh, the tungsten diselenide, uh, sulfur to the selenide. Uh, turns out the moly disulfide, tungsten diselenide, these are the semiconductors, but moly disulfide tend to be the N-type semiconductor, tungsten diselenide becomes P-type semiconductor. If you change the tungsten with a niobium, another 
kind of uh, the metals uh, nearby in the periodic table, suddenly it becomes superconductor uh, uh, in the low temperature. If you change that with the tantalum, uh, uh, moly to the tantalum, tantalum disulfide becomes metal, but it's a strange metal in a sense, if you cool it down, it becomes a charge dense wave system, right? And uh, the list goes on, something like the rather complicated chromium germanium telluride, it turns out this is a magnetic system. Bismuth selenide, uh, this is known to be a topological insulator, which I'm come back uh, a little bit time, uh, later on. But what you see here is that, that only subset of this uh, the 2D materials already they comes with various different type of the properties. In fact, this uh, uh, the uh, the columns of the this name of the materials that more than many many multiple thousands of the materials are now discovered with the various different type of the properties, right? But for before we just kind of go through the many many more materials, uh, let's just uh, repeat these materials onto the this uh, the the row of the here. So what I'm just kind of trying to demonstrate in this table is simply I take the one materials from one side and the other materials from the other side and just combine them together. And that's kind of simple demonstration I gave you before, right? And at this interface of different materials, you start to see that various different type of the new property can emerge. For example, that's simply that what if I just kind of combine with the moly disulfide with tungsten disulfide? And this is N-type uh, semiconductor with the P-type semiconductor. And that's uh, what we know in semiconductor physics is a PN junctions. And that's basis of this, all the uh, semiconductor devices. We know there's a diode formation between the PN junction. Except that, would it be the same thing happen when you just uh, reduce the material thickness down to monoatomic layer? Now, simple physics that we learn from this uh, semiconductor PN junction is that we need the length scale to form so-called this uh, depletion layers which actually control the uh, basis of the PN junctions. Well, that may not happen for the, this atomically thin materials because uh, we have the no length scale that remains to form this uh, depletion layer. So what will happen? Well, before we just kind of pondering, in fact, uh, this type of the system can be easily made. For example, the choosing the P type material and type materials such as a moly diselenide and tungsten diselenide one can just pick them together and put them together, make the simply the PN junctions. And as I said, this is atomically thin PN junctions. So their behavior, behavior may not be that very similar to the this bulk PN junction we know about. Indeed, this type of this, uh, the PN junction can be made by just uh, choosing this right materials and just to shine the light that we can create this excitons in the P and N junctions and as well as the interlay excitons that appears between this two atomic layer. And this interlay excitons is rather special because uh, unlike this bulk PN junctions, because of those junctions so sharp that once you create electron four across them, they can be just kind of situated very close by. So unlike the bulk PN junctions, this interlay, P, uh, the exton formation in this atomically PN, uh, thin PN junction can be very different. And indeed, that's kind of case we are seeing that make the, this, uh, the atomically thin PN junction is distinguishably different from bulk. Now, these uh, junctions uh, can be not only made for the optical devices, you can make the contact uh, between them, as I just demonstrated in the previous slide. You can stack them together and you can make the atomic contacts in both of the layer. And you can uh, study their optical properties as well as electrical properties or both optoelectronic properties in the control of the doping by the gate voltages. So that's kind of something we can do. Uh, optical spectroscopy actually shows that indeed we can create this, uh, the excitons into the this PN junctions. Then they start to demonstrate this kind of beautiful property of the individual layers, as well as its interlayer excitons properties. This interlayer excitons, it turns out can be controlled by the gate voltages. Um, and uh, certainly that we can make the, this uh, PN, uh, chemically PN junctions uh, unlike the bulk pen junction is completely tunable by the gate voltages such that this exciton energy can be also controlled by simply the gate voltages. And turns out this exciton that interaction we create is uh, just kind of separate on the atomic length scale, but they are completely controllable by the gate voltages, but also they have a very long lifetime. And this long lifetime excitons that separate by this uh, thin junction is very important technologically because now, not only you can create this, the, the, the interaction by shining the light or just inject the electron hole into the system, now you can actually control them in spatially and just kind of make the light emissions the locations that you want kind of to make the light emissions. 
And this uh, long-lived exon is uh, quite important also to create this many-body states based on the exons that which I'm going to cover in a moment, right? So once created this type of exon, because they long-lived, they can move around into the uh, your devices into many length, uh, many microns of the length scale. And using this kind of uh, the uh, the disposing the exons as a kind of interesting properties, we can create exons in one locations and move them around to different locations and study about the, their the diffusion properties, that that is one thing. But more important part is we can just utilize those kind of disposing externs to spatially localize some of the locations by just making the device forms and make the this localized externs start to emit by themselves, right? So you can start to see that uh, you can create this, uh, the extents into the nanoscale devices uh, to make the, this nanoscale of the optoelectronic devices. So this is uh, kind of opening up the new technological uh, the, uh, avenues, that, uh, revenues that we can utilize this, uh, the uh, very thin layer of heterostructures, create this optical species, but we can control it electrically and making some of the devices that uh, never existed before. So that is one of the, again, flavor that although that we start with a very simple semiconductor PN junctions. Already, once you create this kind of atomically thin uh, the junctions, their behavior can be quite different, and one can utilize that for the new type of the applications. But we are not only stopped there. In fact, uh, this type of this uh, PN junctions and uh, interlacks and we created immediately brought, bring us the, the possibility getting into the new physics. That is related to the following things. Once we shine this kind of uh, the stronger light into the, this, uh, the PN junctions, atomically PN junction, and create more of this, um, uh, the excitants in there, we start to see that their energy start kind of increases when I just uh, create more of the excitants in there and combine them into the small location. And it turns out that their energy start to increase because of this exciton, which actually has the same dipole moments because it uh, creates the interlayer, uh, they start to repair each other and their energy start becomes larger when you just try to combine them in the location. It turns out this exton is a new species of the quantum particle, what we can call the composite boson. So like the, all these boson, uh, the quantum particle, if you just put them, a lot of them, they can condense into the new many body state, what you call these bosons and condensations, and that becomes quantum mechanical equivalent. Right. And this uh, actually immediately bring us that, for example, we can create uh, some sort of new type of the lasers by just using this boson synchronization. Can we actually do this type of the things? Already is that initial study that we just present here that, uh, that there are enough exons that kind of moves around and they may actually create this boson synchronizations. But actually this current technology we have, this boson synchronizations of this exon, if they happen, can happen only in the low temperature. Can we actually create this in the even higher temperature? Now, this type of this new system can be combined with this nanotechnologies again. We can just create this uh, the location or the trap of the exon in certain part of the sample and that create this exon in the one locations and then they can diffuse into the this trap uh, utilizing this long diffusion length scale and just uh, trap it into the small locations. And if you just kind of make the this trap deep enough, that you can just create this uh, really high density of exons in there, which can boost up this uh, Bose-Einstein condensation even higher temperature. So this is a kind of one of the ongoing research in my group, uh, for example, that can we actually create this atomically thin layer, create this, uh, uh, the new composite uh, quantum particles in there. Can we create the emergent phenomena based on that? And eventually can we use that for some of the interesting, uh, the, future applications. So that is one of the cross sections, how we can start with this creating this, uh, the, uh, the quantum structures, although this is a simple PN junctions, simply making quantum structures, you start to see that interesting device operation as well as uh, this new physics arises from uh, this example. I will just kind of expand this idea a little bit more that kind of broad sense and just kind of introduce uh, this uh, field of the quantum matter for the quantum device. I think uh, this, uh, in the end of the, uh, this uh, second part of the presentation, I will give you some another example that going in my group, but I want to kind of introduce uh, some of the, this field in a little bit more uh, the basic sense. So this quantum materials and especially topological quantum materials uh, which I'm going to kind of touch upon uh, toward the end, 
is a relatively new concept that arrived into the uh, condensed matter physics um, probably about 10 or again 15 years ago. But it become quickly gained a lot of the efforts and a lot of uh, the uh, exciting new uh, science also comes out from uh, China as well. Uh, and uh, eventually this may actually tend to the, come to the new type of the device, what we call often the quantum devices. And this is not necessarily replacing the silicon, but may actually provide somewhat different type of functionality that silicon device can perform, such that it can be complementary kind of devices. So let me start with the first that they introduced the sum of the word, for example, quantum materials and topological. What really does that mean? All right. Let's start with what is quantum materials. Quantum materials, I think if you just kind of Google it and find out a couple of these review papers, they define kind of rather complicated ways and there is a history of the quantum materials uh, that superconductor quantum physics and that's combined there and some, some over the times, probably if you trace it back, it's coming from the 1980s or even before that, right? Uh, if I just kind of summarize some of the interesting keywords about quantum material is that there's correlations. It's that usually many body uh, quantum correlation is what we mean correlation. And recent idea is a basic topological. And this is something that also needs a little bit of explanation. And then combined together, we want to have the Amazon phenomena. So I will just kind of try to give you some of the example, what we mean by this correlation, topological Amazon, right? One way that you can get this idea of this, what is this quantum material, what is correlation, emergent, and those kind of behavior is simply just through this list of the Nobel Prize in condensed matter physics. And more than half of the Nobel Prize in condensed matter physics is somehow tied with this quantum matter, quantum materials. Uh, you can see the superconductivities and the, some of the magnetic system, quantum Hall effect. And that, uh, that later on, there's topological insulator, topological phases. You start to see that get the sense that uh, the, in fact, over the hundred years of the time, the, a lot of the Nobel Prize is being the, kind of uh, the, given to the recognize some of the efforts, understanding this quantum nature of the matter, right? And among them, uh, a lot of this Nobel Prize is in, in fact uh, that uh, awarded to the, the understanding of the superconductivity. In some sense, the superconductivity is uh, the uh, really uh, paradigmatic uh, the example of showing the correlation of the system. Superconductor is nothing but just a certain matter. If you just cool down the temperature low enough, suddenly you just completely lose the resistivity. And it was first discovered many at the, about 100 years ago, 150, 15 years ago now, uh, this uh, Johannes Ones at the Netherlands see that first time that when you cooled out the mercury below the four Kelvin, suddenly so resistivity goes away, right? And that's basically perfect conductions. But on the top of that, it turns out, it actually expelled the magnetic field. So it is not only perfect conduction, uh, it's actually something go beyond that. Uh, people have been just looking for the, what is the fundamental mechanisms behind of this, uh, this uh, superconductivity. It turns out uh, the, the fundamental uh, the, uh, the mechanism is in fact coming from the correlation. In the, in the metal, due to the somehow the uh, mediate attractive interactions uh, between two electrons, for example, by the mediated phonons, the electrons start kind of uh, attract each other overcoming their Coulomb interactions, they can form the Cooper pair. And this Cooper pair as a boson, as I mentioned before, can be condensed into many body state. And that's basically essential part to create this uh, superconductivity. Of course, that was recognized by the uh, cooper schrieffer uh, theory by the BCS theory uh, and recognized by Nobel Prize in the 1972. But it basically gives us a basic sense that how this correlation get changes this uh, physics, underlying physics greatly in this certain materials. And it becomes quite ubiquitous in the many of the different system, but quite kind of recently that this type of superconductivity appears probably going beyond of this BCS uh, type of description. That bring us that kind of very kind of the exciting new field of the understanding of the emergent phenomena or the unconventional superconductivity that uh, is one of the, uh, the core part of this quantum matter physics studies. Not only this fundamental physics, uh, this superconductivity becomes quite important tools for the modern applications. Of course, the zero resistivity can be used as uh, the power line. And uh, in fact, uh, this superconducting power line has, is being used in certain parts of the world 
basically deliver the power in the macroscopic scale without any loss of the power uh, uh, delivery between them. And the large scale of the application of superconductor, basically using the Meissen effect to expel this magnetic field uh, uh, in, inside of superconductor can be used even just a levitate heavy object like the train and it's a superconducting magnetic levitate train. These are some of the things that are being used in the world. For example, in the Shanghai that uh, this, uh, the magnetic levitate train is already being used and many places now just try to use a superconductor of the levitating train. And that is one of the exciting uh, uh, the applications. But perhaps more of this, uh, the uh, exciting application, especially tied with the quantum matter, is uh, this so-called uh, the quantum computing. Superconducting Josephson junction is one of these uh, frame that people now try to realize quantum computing so based on there. Indeed, uh, there, there's a worldwide race actually is being happened. Uh, among these big uh, giant uh, the IT companies, uh, such as Google, Intel, IBM, Microsoft, try to come up with uh, this uh, the quantum computing with many different types of the material platform. Turns out this superconducting Josephson junction platform is one of these um, uh, important platform to realize this quantum computers. Realize that these quantum computers, uh, right now we have about 50 or 100 uh, qubits that operation. To get into the realistic the quantum computing platform, we need probably uh, uh, several hundreds, even thousands, and uh, ideally more of the qubits operating in the system is needed. Turns out right now the superconducting based on the qubits is greatly suffer from these error corrections. We cannot make them kind of completely comp uh, uh, perfect, such that operating one qubits, one necessarily need many different type of the qubits to make the error corrections. To overcome this type of the, uh, the, the drawback, one of the idea is, is there a new material platform we can realize these uh, qubits? And there comes again, this uh, quantum materials and aspect of the so-called topological quantum material comes in where you don't necessarily need the error corrections because it has a built-in uh, topological the protection of the quantum states in there, right? So then it naturally need now the world of the topology. So let me just uh, dwell on the world of the topologies uh, kind of a uh, 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 few minutes. Well, if you again the Google that to learn about the topology, it comes out kind of following thing. Topology is a branch of the mathematics, so study about this, uh, the general categorization of the shape of the object. It's not necessarily the geometry, but it's actually shape or connectivity of the shape, which actually can continuously alter one to the other. And well, there is a way that you can categorize uh, this kind of shape. For example, the one of the good example is that they're showing this animation the donuts and mug cups, it has only one hole in the three-dimensional object. And that can be in terms of the topologies categorized of the same topological systems, right? That example actually goes on many of the unique the, the different system. For example, here is uh, the another unique uh, object called the uh, trefoil knot. This is another kind of interesting topological object which, which we can categorize. In terms of more like the 2D system, one can obviously think about the uh, Mobius strips where that it has uh, the, the same side, that there is only one side across the surface. And you start to see that there are that way that mathematicians comes around how to categorize a different type of these uh, geometry shapes based on this connectivity. Why this becomes quite kind of connected with the physics suddenly or even matter? I think this requires a little bit of the digression of the physics history. So I will just bring you back to about 150 years ago when uh, Professor Edwin Hall discovered so-called the Hall effect. So this Hall effect is nothing but uh, Edwin Hall was interested in the how electrons start kind of moves around under the magnetic field. He used a very thin strip of the thin gold foil, which is available back then, the thinnest material that uh, uh, he can find and simply applying the, the current through that and apply the magnetic field and measure the voltage across that uh, the perpendicular direction of the current. And the reason is that, uh, well, if we just know about this, uh, uh, the Lorentz force under the magnetic field, uh, we know that electron motion or any charged particle motion in the, under the magnetic field can be deflected. And simply measuring the voltage uh, perpendicular direction of the current, you can measure the, how much electron deflection is happening there. So in other words, you can measure the Lorentz force in this way. So uh, Hall showed that indeed, if you just measure the voltage across the, uh, the current directions, 
and just uh, divide this uh, voltage with the current such that you get the resistance unit, what we call this whole resistance. The whole resistance simply increases with the magnetic field, which means that Lorentz force is just kind of linearly increasing with the magnetic field. And this is one of the really important demonstration. Indeed, uh, the current is carried by this charged particle into the system and they undergo the, the, uh, the magnetic field. Well, while this is a really kind of classic example of the physics, how they worked it up, uh, this whole measurement has been served as a really important tool for the many people, including the semiconductor uh, engineers to detect amount of the charge into the semiconductor, right? Now, this whole measurement turned into the new era about 100 years later when uh, Professor Klaus uh, von Klitting actually repeat the same experiments but extreme to the limits. So back then in 1980s, now semiconductor technology has, has been evolved. So people know how to make this interface of the silicon with the silicon oxide and applying the, uh, the gate voltages across it. Now, finally, the, the people can realize the electron confined to the two-dimensional system. So now the system is not yet this completely 2D, but you can see that effectively one can create the two-dimensional electron system by just as this semiconductor. And this is basically the beginning of the low dimensional physics. Basically now people can create this electron combined the two dimensions. And certainly one thing that natural question one can ask is what happens when you apply uh, the magnetic field and what type of hole effect you will get. And two dimensional system like the gold foil, naively you expect that when you apply the magnetic field and measure whole resistance, you expect that the linear increase of the resistance is expected. Uh, well, quite surprisingly, actually nobody uh, beating the, uh, everybody's expectation. What Klitschin found is that the resistance indeed increase, whole resistance increases, but not continuously, but there's a discrete level. And that discrete level is uh, so precise in some sense, uh, that uh, one level to the second level and third level comes in that if it is one, it's a half, one third and one fourth. And some of the, this uh, beautiful mathematics is governing behind of this of the whole effect, right? So natural thing is what is really behind of this, uh, the discreteness that tied with these uh, numbers, uh, more precise integer numbers, what now we call the integer quantum effect. Of course, this discovery is so important. It was also re recognized by the Nobel Prize in 1985. But the explanation of the, those kind of quanta quantization actually comes in from uh, rather old physics already figured out in the beginning of the quantum physics. In already in 1930, Landau uh, studied about when you apply the magnetic field in the electronic system in combined the two dimensions, uh, he, uh, he discovered that this electron orbit should be quantized. Uh, classically, there is a cyclotron motion of this orbit, but applying the quantum physics, uh, that orbit will quantize, and this quantization condition will give you a discrete energy level into the system. So that's basically what the Landau discovered. And how that is actually connected with the discovery that uh, the, uh, the clinching made, why actually people did miss it out? Why they didn't expect that uh, the quantum, uh, the Whole, uh, whole resistance should be quantized. In some sense, that is basically beginning that people start to realize there is a deep connection between topology to the electronic structures. And it can be explained in the following way. As Landau just can point it out, under the strong magnetic field, electron orbit will be quantized. And one can describe this quantized orbits in terms of the wave function, which is complex number. Any complex number has uh, its own phase in there. So this phase that tied with this complex number plays a very important role in the following way. Let me show you again this, uh, the quantized whole sequences, right? Now, as I mentioned, this whole, the quantized whole sequences uh, can be described by this integer numbers. So one, two, three, four, five. Basically, the, if we call the first step is one, second step, which is half of this uh, the step side height, comes with now that th three is basically one third of this so first step size. So you see that there's integer numbers that are associated with it. Detail of the understanding, applying this Landauer's uh, theory onto the, this uh, two-dimensional system, turns out the wave functions that the, the phase of the wave function, as because of this is a phase that describes the angle, 
angle has a property such that if you just kind of turn around 360 degree, it should come back its own, right? But it can come back to the one, but you can come back two, three times, or three, four times. So basically there's a winding of the, this angle can be described. And especially in the two dimensions where that this winding is related looping, unless you disconnect this loop, there's a well-defined winding number we can assign into the phases, which means that the winding number one, winding number two, three, four, and this is basically discretized numbers. It turns out the wave function described about this quantizations is precisely tied with this winding number, and that appears as a, this uh, quantized whole step into the system. So you start to see that this quantization, this criticalness we are seeing in the two-dimensional system under the magnetic field is deeply tied with the sum of this uh, winding number, which is kind of tied with this uh, two-dimensional topologies in the two-dimensional system. So that has been kind of really good tie of the, this, uh, the topologies into the system. Why this is important? Because this topology is basically guaranteed the robustness. You may see that this uh, device that one can measure quantum effect is uh, rather complicated and uh, precise. Actually, they are now. The way that do the experiment, typical lab, is something like this. You just cut it out and just kind of make the, this whole bar even just kind of scratching and just bond it with this uh, by hand, right? This is a physicist's first experiment we can do. Of course, uh, one can make it much better and fancier. But even with this dirty, ugly device, if you measure quantum effect, they're so precise up to the this billions of this uh, uh, part per billion of the precisions. This tells us there is an enormous of the robustness comes in into the, this one. And that's deeply tied with the basic topologies I was talking about. And that brings us a very important uh, lesson here. And this the robustness may be useful for some of the this device applications. I will share the one of the view here. One of the view of this using this robustness of the device applications following. Under the magnetic field and finite size of sample, again, topology actually provides something interesting. So because of the, when you have the finite sample, sample electrons is confined in the system. Electron will see that either this quantum system, which I call one called the topological, right? Versus all the vacuum, which is just kind of vacuum, nothing. There is no topologies there. Right. One thing interesting about the topological system is when the system, topological system ends with an interface with a different type of system with a different topological number, for example, vacuum, at the edge of this or the surface of the system, there's a unique the material properties appears, what we often call the surface states or the edge states in this two-dimensional system. What is the property of this edge system in the topological, uh, the quantum one system is quite unique. If you think about, I have this quantize of the electron system, at the edge is basically cannot complete the orbits, therefore it will be bouncing back off, uh, bouncing, right? And then it's a keep bouncing off such that you can start to see that at edge of the, this uh, quantum one system, you expect indeed that there is the, the pathway that the charge can flow, what we call, often call this is the edge state. Turns out this edge state is robust because of this, uh, the robust topology I was mentioning. And robust means here that when you just put the electron in there, they were just kind of going through without any energy dissipation. So it's almost a kind of similar to the superconductor, but it's actually a very different origin. In the superconductor, basically this is bosons and condensations of the, uh, the Cooper pairs that, that the electron got correlated. But here, this one is basically this patient edge state, one dimensional state coming from topologies that uh, I just kind of mentioned, right? Why this is exciting? Of course, uh, this is a very interesting, uh, intriguing physical states, Amazon physical state. But on the top of that, this can be quite useful for uh, application. I told you in the very beginning of the, my talk, that uh, modern silicon technology provide us the, uh, the uh, computer chips that billions of tens of billions of the uh, transistors in there. The problem of that is that there are so many transistors, so many electrons moving in such a cramped space. So there's a lot of power dissipation. We already see that our computer becomes hard, our cell phone becomes hard when we use kind of really long time. And part of the reason is there are so many components, so many electrons move around in so cramped space, such as like the traffic jams in this really crowded uh, space where the humans, the cars are moving around. 
becomes kind of rather hectic and even slow down and try to make the, this computer fast. Somehow you have to find out that can we actually make the, these things much more movie efficient way. We know that in the human scale, what are the solutions? We can build up the highway. We can build up this uh, dividing line between the road such that only the moves on one side, uh, one, one side of the road, you are only allowed to move one way or the other side of the road, you can move only the, the other way. Precisely this is the concept one can introduce in topology system. For example, in the quantum system, when we have the edge states, you move only one way versus the other directions, right? We'll make the, this move really, really efficient way, right? Okay, so quantum system, for example, can provide those kind of solutions. Only the problem of the quantum system is the following. It requires low temperature and high magnetic field. So it seems like they're rather impractical at this point, but at least they give us a sense that uh, combining topology with uh, the system, we may be able to kind of bring into the kind of interesting systems here. Is there any other solutions we can just come, up, come around? Well, there comes that basically the next chapter of the stories. That's where that we can introduce quantum matter, different type of quantum matter to give you solutions of the, this problem. Let me start with my favorite quantum matter where that uh, a lot of my research kind of based on, which is uh, related with the graphene. And before that I introduce the graphene, I have to give you that one piece of the physics that you can appreciate why the graphene is uh, interesting and useful. And that one piece of the quantum physics is a related quantum mechanical spin. Although electron, has this uh, magnetic moment, uh, moment, which we can describe in terms of spin. And this spin, uh, electron spin, often we call the spin half, has a very intriguing and interesting property, the following. When we just turn around this electron spin, it turns out it doesn't go back its own. It's a very different from the three-dimensional object we can spin around. And this is a related effect that spin half of the, this, uh, the object on the quantum mechanics can only describe by the two components, spin up and down is enough to even explain the spin on the left or spin on the right. And that was kind of rather unique the quantum mechanical properties that uh, basically going beyond of our typical everyday in, uh, intuitions. But that will give us rather unique properties such as following. If I just turn around the spin half of the electron once, it doesn't go back to its own. It actually go back with a negative sign in front of it, which means when I just turn around twice, it go back to its own, right? So property that, uh, uh, that only when you just turn around twice, go back to the, the its, uh, itself, is a very different from macroscopic object. For example, the human being like me, that when I turn around 360 degree, you will see that I don't change it. You see the same, uh, same person like me, right? But if it were electron, if we just change the electron the 360 degree, it turn into the negative sign in front of it. It turn, you need to turn twice to negate this negative sign in front to get the cell. In other words, when you just have the electron and turn around 360 degree, effectively it make the, you make the only half turn. And that's a very important the concept of half turn. Even if 360 degree, make the electron only half turn. Now, why that becomes important? And that is related with kind of topological structures, right? For example, in the Mabius uh, strips, you can just do the exercise by yourself, right? Make the Mabius strips like this and start to move the electron from one side of strips and turn around one time. You will find out this, the, the starting point the electron that comes, oops. It turns around 360, you get the opposite side with the opposite side of the spin. So only when you make the take the turn twice, that electron come back its own. So you start to see that, that kind of interesting sense that this, uh, the uh, speed have tied with some of the interesting topologies on that, right? So why this becomes relevant with the graphene? When graphene was first discovered in uh, 2004, that uh, by just uh, the uh, Gaiman Nobel who got the Nobel Prize in the, several years later, it becomes quite obvious. This structure of graphene is quite unique. First of all, this is a repeating unit here is hexagon. But if you just kind of think about what is my unit cell repeating within hexagon, there are two carbon atoms in there. And this two carbon atom plays kind of interesting role because if you just try to build up the 
quantum wave function describe electrons that are living in these two, two carbon atoms, which are not equivalent to each other. And that's kind of important point. Uh, then you naturally need a two component to describe your wave function. Now you start to see that, oh, there are two components of the wave function. It looked like the kind of description of the spin I just tried to describe a moment ago, which actually precisely give you very similar mathematical structures on this wave function, such that when I just turn around the electron across this, uh, the make the this circle of the electron in the graphene, basically I have to make the twice two turns to make this up. Basically, the, it, this the two component units of the wave functions give you very similar structures of the spin uh, of the electron. Make the, hence, make the, this electron need to effectively turn around twice to go, come back so on. Why this becomes quite interesting? Well, it becomes interesting because uh, when you measure this quantum hole physics into the graphene, precisely that plays a role. Here is a quantum effect of one measuring graphene, right? And you start to see that there's a step appears as I just described, but the size of the step or that where that this integer numbers associate step is a kind of different. It's a, like the two, six and 10. It's not like the one, two, three, four, or it's not regularly spaced more precisely. There's an interesting sequence of these numbers going on, right? You may say that what is this step two, six, 10, 14 indicating? You can quickly figure it out this number is nothing but four times of half integer, right? And precisely that this four in fact is related with that there's a spin and the, uh, the valley degree of freedom we have to just multiply. But more important part I want kind of uh, address here is that this half integer. And this half integer is basically precisely related with electron need to turn around twice. Basically it's related with interesting topology embedded into the graphene's electronic structures, right? And you start to see that in this quantum matter, you can actually engineer in some of the interesting topologies by just kind of carefully arrange this atomic length scale, atomic, atomic structures, and embed those kind of the things into the imprint, those kind of topologies into the electron wave functions. And this is a good example of this graphene that show that how that this type of the topology worked in the electronic structures. Now, of course, the graphene is not only one. It, one can generate this or generalize this type of concept more theoretically. In fact, it has been done over the time. Simply people didn't appreciate quite recently that how this tide is exactly made, but there has been groundbreaking work by the Taoists and Hardin and Kosterlis. And this work actually uh, created that indeed this the topologies, especially in the low dimensions, uh, electronic system topologies can tie into the electronic structures and create this type of uh, new electronic property materials in there. And of course, uh, the seminar work got recognized quite recently in again, the Nobel Prize in the physics. It's not only theory, but one by one after graphene, people realize indeed one can make these materials that with topological structures. And there are the many seminar work in fact coming from the China uh, as well. Um, in the end of the day, Physicists realize that indeed you can create this uh, the topological matter where that in principle one can create this uh, counter uh, the edge state that indicating this the topology of the system at the boundary can be created even without magnetic field and create the sum of the concept. Maybe one can use this as uh, some of the interesting device applications, right? So final device application or final uh, idea with this one, uh, eventually, I want to kind of make the yet another connections that kind of tie back to something I mentioned before. So two of this, the interesting system I was kind of giving you is uh, the superconductor. And the second part is uh, this uh, topological system, more like the derivative, derivative of this quantum system, right? That seems like the two of the interesting, the pillar of the modern quantum matter. Indeed they are, right? but they can be also connected and they can be very useful. Not only interesting, but they can be useful. And that is related following things. So what if we simply just combine the superconductor with the topological system, for example, topological insulator, the one of these most topological system. They figured out that it was uh, a Fu and Keynes work uh, the recently. They figured out then at the interface, there's a superconductivity appears 
but this superconductor is often what is called the topological superconductivities, where they have the very unique physics can be described something that one can borrow from high energy physics, often called the Majorana physics. I don't want to go over too much of this detail of Majorana physics, but it's a very intriguing emergent particle in the sense that, that once that quasi-particle of the superconductor, excitation of the superconductor appears, this quasi-particle has interesting properties such that uh, if we just kind of have the same quasi-particle, but when I just kind of exchange them or so-called braiding them, they don't come back its own. They comes all this history behind embedded in those kind of things. This is what we often call this braiding of this uh, the Majorana fermions. It turns out this braiding of the, this, the, uh, the Majorana fermions, or more precisely, or more generally, non-abelian anions, has a great implication of the quantum computing. This is basically protected by the topologies as you just make the knob. Once you create those kind of braiding operation, this is very difficult to undo. It's very difficult to make the errors onto the, this operation. And this becomes kind of one of the important probably the uh, method we can use of quantum computing if you can realize it. The problem is how we can realize this type of system in the real life. There has been some of the efforts uh, to create this, uh, the combine the superconductor with the topological system. For example, you just uh, take the semiconducting nano wires uh, with a strong spin of coupling, apply the magnetic field and make the topological system combine with the superconductor and create this myelin fermions. Or you combine with the ferromagnetic uh, wires with the uh, uh, superconductors and try to create this kind of myron fermion. But it has been always a challenge how we can make that in terms of device forms and the really demonstrate operation. There comes again 2D materials because 2D material comes with the various different types, as I mentioned, and they comes with the uh, uh, semiconductor, superconductors, uh, magnetic systems, and then Beyond that, we can also combine them to create these uh, rather complicated structures. So for example, can we actually create those, those kinds of systems by combining uh, magnetic systems with the, uh, the topological system? Or can we make the sum of the topologies by combining just those kinds of systems? So certainly, this is one of the real active fields a lot of people are working on. Good example is, for example, you can start with the graphene, apply the magnetic field, or you can just kind of proximitize with the topological insulators to create these edge states. And then coupled with the superconductor, you can create this Majorana type of the particle at the end of the, this, uh, the wires. You can just kind of not only stop one, combine them, you can just uh, try to kind of create the breeding. And all of these efforts start kind of going on using this uh, two-dimensional platform of the system. So that's kind of one of the really active field. Can we realize a new quantum system based on this type of the, uh, the operation? But let's actually go beyond that. I just kind of come back to the, this, uh, the table I showed you. So it's combining with the two different system that you can create this uh, new type of functionalities. But I just uh, gross over the one important possibilities. Just make the junction by themselves. For example, graphene to graphene. Moly disulfide, moly disulfide. You may ask, hey, that's uh, the same materials. That what do we expect? But there's one more important now that I want to mention before I end my talk. That is, even with the same material, you can stack them together with the different angles or different combinations to create the different operation to the system. Why that's interesting? Because even with the different uh, same materials, but different angle stacking, you create completely different functionalities. And part of the reason is basically in that structures, you lose complete uh, periodicity and you restore the quasi-periodicity, uh, what you call the more periodicity, which can be tunable by tuning the angle. And that will also modify the electronic structures on the system. And one can utilize this as a creating new functionality in the system. Initially, people came without it as skeptics, say, is this really going to work? But actually the field was really hardly hit by uh, exciting discoveries that happened two years ago by the uh, Pablo Ayala's group at the MIT. They showed, you, showed when you just kind of make the, this twisted layer of simple graphene with so-called magic angle about 1.1 degree, suddenly system becomes insulating. But then when you adopt this insulator, suddenly system becomes superconducting. So it's the same vanilla plane graphene but simply kind of put into the different angle and put into the different density, 
you start created some such a diverse kind of uh, the behavior, even just insulated to the superconductor tunable. This is an amazing uh, the possibility one can provide. And all of these things is indeed the related with this engineering of the materials into the more length scale, something like tens of nanometer length scale, under a nanometer length scale, with even the same materials. So the table that I provide you, that what is a diverse system we can get, as you see that it's not only the different material choices we can make, the kind of new functionalities, but also you can even just choose the same material or the different, different materials and give you a different angle. And then you, yet you get different functionalities there. So I think that's probably what I want to kind of tell you about this, all the uh, exciting opportunity we have uh, toward getting to the quantum materials and the applications. And as you see here, that we are not in short of the material system, so go to. All right, the last thing I want to kind of thank is my group members, which actually uh, brought the materials that I just pre present today. And uh, with their hard work that uh, the, some of the, the, I'm very glad that we are, uh, we are one of these uh, forefront groups uh, working on this uh, quantum materials based on 2D system and the Van der Waals structures. I expect more uh, kind of exciting the news will arrive uh, in, in this field. Thank you very much. Miso, you are on mute. Sorry. Yeah, again, <laughs> I'm on now. Um, I feel like um, we explore two big words like from quantum physics and then like all those materials uh, words again. So yeah, it was so amazing and thank you so much. And here's our first question. Professor Kim, it's a fantastic talk and thank you for sharing your great work. Um, I, I feel the same. The question is the most of 2D materials are composed of transition metal and charcoal elements. What are the next generation of 2D materials? For example, like three, five semiconductor 2D materials? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. And uh, indeed, uh, there are already uh, a lot of the different types of 2D materials arise. I think uh, I just kind of showed today kind of simple example of the graphene, boron nitride, and mm -hmm. uh, transition metal dichalcogenide. Uh, but the list actually grows uh, really fast. And then uh, some of them actually spans in our the more traditional semiconductor side as well. So I think uh, it will come through the, even further. Um, also, uh, not only this Van der Waals 2D materials, it seems like the now 2D material can be combined with the more traditional 3-5 type of semiconductor heterostructures. There's also fantastic work that I've been seeing that uh, people can, can grow the epitaxially that this 3-5 uh, semiconductor on the top of this uh, Van der Waals system. In fact, Van der Waals system can be sandwiched between these two epitaxially grown the 3-5 uh, system. So, uh, there you can even just uh, think about some of the hybrid uh, between these uh, the three five more 3D heterostructures with the 2D heterostructures. I think that's another possibility. But in terms of the new materials, I think I almost lost the track now because uh, every day, every week, uh, there are many of these uh, the 2D materials arrived into, into the real world. And theorists already start to kind of look for that, uh, what are possible the 2D system? Uh, then uh, people are using this machine learning algorithms and then tied with this uh, uh, DFT type of the calculation. They start kind of stacks up that more of the possibility now and experimentalists are busy to just to really find out the, uh, the what are really uh, the existing form of the materials. So I guess that um, the, the, the list of the materials are really grow fast. But the problem we have in a sense is we cannot just follow the, all the materials. So at some point we should, find, uh, we should make the choice, right? Which one we want to kind of study, which combination we want to choose, right? Because the phase space is really large. And where we get this intuition is a rather uh, tricky problem. So of course we can uh, draw the, our uh, own experience and try to kind of make the, the uh, rational that what is a, a next choice of the matter. Uh, but even that, because of material, the bank start grows really fast. Maybe one need a little bit of this uh, different algorithm, the machine learning type of the algorithm to try to find and narrow down our considerations with the uh, right category. I think that we are getting very quickly yeah, onto yeah. The, this, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, the interesting, intriguing era that 
we need some of the, this machine learning type of aid to really choose the right, uh, right directions to go. Yeah, it's really expanding. <laughs> so the, uh, let's go to the next question. My question is, what is the application of quantum materials and what is the future about this kind of materials like applications and properties improvement? And that's the right, I think that tied with the uh, recent surge of so-called quantum science, quantum engineering, I would say, right? Because worldwide now this quantum engineering quantum science becomes quite kind of a uh, great keyword. And there are a lot of the uh, foods worldwide, uh, Europe, US, China, Korea, Japan. I think there are uh, many countries now just put kind of quite of stress uh, onto the, uh, this quantum engineering. And part of the reason is of course, now quantum mechanics has been around almost hundred years now, um, right? And uh, now the technological development uh, start to make that this quantum physics is not only just the, the physicist, the, uh, the toy to understand the, uh, the nature, but it becomes a really relevant engineering wise, right? So there, the quantum material science or quantum material research becomes one of the important pillar of the quantum engineering because quantum engineering, like the quantum devices, quantum sensing, quantum communications, rely on all this device. And device should be made on top of the, some sort of material platform, right? Some of the, these technologies are really based on the, some of the known materials. Say, I briefly mentioned the quantum computing. One of the four, one of the uh, quantum computing is based on uh, superconducting Josephson junctions, which is based on aluminum Josephson junctions or maybe niobium Josephson junctions, right? This is known materials. Superconductivity there is something known, right? But if you want to make the leap on there, for example, to get into the uh, really uh, fourth tolerant quantum computing, right? Which is one of the topic that I just briefly mentioned. Mm -hmm. And there might be this quantum materials uh, which actually provide the topological superconductivity becomes quite important, right? Some of the quantum sensing, uh, extreme sensitivity of this, uh, the, uh, some of the quantum matter can be quite useful, right? So I think uh, these are some of the example that uh, Maybe this developing quantum materials and uh, getting this uh, new emergent phenomena, robust quantum phenomena, uh, might be that could be very important uh, vehicle that realize the uh, quantum applications or, uh, based on quantum devices. Super. Um, uh, yeah, again, there are so many questions. So number three is, dear Professor Kim, graphene is a well-known materials and Huawei has developed a graphene-based battery for cell phones. This may be the first mass production good of um, graphene. In your opinion, which can be the next possibility? What is the big challenges uh, for this material? I, I think you have to reveal your own secret. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't know that I have any secrets. <laughs> uh, okay, so I think, uh, yes, uh, there are the applications uh, in terms of this low dimensional materials, including graphene, there are many different applications. I think uh, uh, some of the applications require more the electronic, uh, optoelectronic, and that's a for, I would say, semiconductor style of the application where the purities and the, the control of this, uh, or the, uh, defects in materials becomes extremely important. The other application is of course more mass and then uh, the mass productions is important, right? And uh, there that it, in, indeed, uh, how expensive is this graphene per kilogram? I think, what is dollar per kilogram? I think those kinds of things is quite important, not only the properties. Um, the battery productions or that uh, the composite uh, type of the application is a good example that there that how the mass production, the high quality of the graphene can be incorporated into the system becomes quite important. And I'm glad there are quite a bit of efforts uh, and the progress has been made. Indeed, uh, I heard that graphene becomes already a graphene incorporated into some of the battery applications, enhances this battery's lifetime as well as the capacities in there. And this is kind of very encouraging because people are always waking, uh, they, uh, they're asking that, all right, so you guys can discover the new materials where and when this can be used. And uh, the, just to show that, hey, here is that really one of the real applications in there. I think this is something that people always have dreamed of. Unfortunately, I'm not a real expert on this uh, mass productions and high quality graphene as well as this uh, 
the use in the batteries. I cannot make the good comments on how, uh, how this will look like with, in fact, uh, uh, compare with these competing technologies. But certainly that I heard about the stories and a, uh, as a, one of the researchers that starting working on the graphene, I'm very excited about that. Uh, now, finally, that uh, when my father comes in, hey, so uh, uh, where is the application of graphene? That, hey, it's in your cell phone now. <laughs> uh, once you get in that stage, it becomes a quite kind of exciting stories. Uh, I would say kind of one of the success stories one can, one can tell. Great. Um, so I guess this is the last question. Professor Kim, great talk. You mentioned many materials, but not include the CNT. Could you please comment on it? And as a new graduate, graduate student, I'm thinking whether I should choose this field or not. <laughs> oh, this is a tricky one. <laughs> I think it's not tricky. I think, um, <laughs> you know, I think uh, materials has the fashion, uh, uh, it's its own cycle, I would say. So, uh, it's, it's more fashionable materials, more popular material that mm -hmm. uh, it come and go. I think uh, I've been in this field some some some, some years, uh, right? And uh, when I started out the graduate school, I think everybody's working on uh, uh, high temperature superconductor, right? Mm -hmm. And then it soon turned into the nanotube, and then uh, I yeah, that when I was doing the postdoc, for example, that. Everybody is working on the nanotube and it becomes so important field. And then it turns into graphene and turn into the 2D materials or that other materials, topological system. You know that they're always kind of the, the keyword in these materials in the field. Um, of course, uh, the hard, so-called hard and famous materials, the nice thing about that is that there is excitement in the field and then uh, you tend to work on that uh, something that you can easily write a paper, I would say. Well, but at the same time, there are a lot of competition in the field, right? So, uh, so they're always pro and con, right? But is this really important? Do you have to work on always hot field? I don't think so. I think uh, a good example that I can show, uh, I can tell you is, well, uh, when I work on nanotube, of course, nanotube is hot field that, that uh, I know that uh, I know that what we can do on the nanotube, right? But then uh, the back then, say graphene two D materials, there's almost none of people working on. There are only few groups are working on, right? But happened to be that becomes an extra hot material. So I was lucky enough such that I, I was kind of working part of the this graphene as my research. So when it comes into the uh, really important issues, I was kind of. Uh, uh, I was one of the one that in front of the line research kind of quite from the beginning. So that was, I would say the lucky, right? But that was kind of pure luck. And same things happen in many different places. Certain materials was not a popular material, not necessarily, but becomes someday it becomes popular, right? But some days it becomes important. I would say the same thing on the nanotube. In the beginning of the nanotube research, it was not hard, but suddenly it becomes hard, but then, Nanotube is not a fashionable materials anymore. And uh, mm -hmm. as a physicist, I actually still do have the nanotube work in my group, and I still kind of keep publishing it in the, nano, uh, the research in nanotube. Well, it's not necessarily competitive anymore, but this is probably the right time. I can do really deep, interesting questions I can ask with a little bit of the time of the careful study. Right? And I feel like that, that is a very important. I think tied back to with this graphene now being used into the, uh, the battery. In fact, nanotube already is in the battery in many places as well, even before the graphene. And how it was possible, there are people that was not a fashionable anymore. It is not hard anymore, but put a lot of the careful efforts and careful studies, make these materials really being used into the, uh, into the real world. I would say same thing in the graphene. You know, that compare with uh, the two, 10 years ago, graphene is not necessarily hard anymore. It becomes a little bit, uh, slightly harder because of twisted uh, uh, bilayer graphene superconductivity, but it's not as hard as before. And probably a lot of research is moving so called the other 2D materials, right? But this is probably the right time that one can study really important things in the graphene and careful things. And for example, Study about graphene, bring to the new uh, the real world the battery. I think this type of the thing is something also very important task to us, right? 
So there is, I would say, always pro and con between hard material versus less hard material, which is important. I don't think that uh, it probably doesn't matter. We just do that. Uh, what I can do the best with the given this uh, situations, what I'm interested in. Yeah. yeah, I am so agreeing with you. With when you choose a research topic, there are always pros and cons. And I'm I'm asked the questions by the students that whether they should work on solar cells or energy harvesting, yeah. the mechanical energy harvesting, or anything else. And I cannot say because there are always pros and cons. And then you you have to decide. And and thank you. Thank you so much for the oh, exact okay. answers. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I think we are done uh, with the questions. So Alice should back to wrap up and then... Okay, Kim, uh, Professor Kim yeah. and uh, Minso, thank you so much. Yeah, great, great talks. Yeah, actually we learned a lot. Now you can see the numbers was on the screen. Yeah, we oh. have uh, 300. Yeah. Yeah, 11,000 students was listen to your talk. So congratulations. It's really, you, really amazing. Much. Yeah. Uh, so this was a certification for you. But before I give the certification to you, I want to ask you a question. Actually, I leave the last questions to myself as a hoster. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, Professor Kim, as you mentioned, you know, the materials. Uh, a very nice story. So you tell from beginning how the physics, you know, uh, the uh, the scientists, you know, from the fundamentally, they found that and then go ahead to eventually to get the material, the golf certifications. I think this is really a different way because uh, most of us, you know, uh, audience was from the engineering part. Yeah, normally we think that we just take the materials. Yeah, if it has such functions, we can use it. If it don't have such function, okay, we just choose other materials. But you think from the other way, you know, from fundamentally, you know, how to design the material to have such functions. So, uh, really a, a, a great achievement here. So, I want you give some comments on this for the students, most from the engineering part, how they can, you know, um, calibrate out, you know, to go together with the people in the physics school, you know, to get the material, the new material, to develop new materials together. Is that possible? Or you have some damage? I think uh, even my group, I think there are uh, students actually more of the fundamental physics side. There are students more applied, even the engineering students. Uh, I think uh, the, my feeling is modern science and technology, engineering, uh, distance are very close to each other. I think there's uh, no kind of close boundary that I can just cut it out. Hey, here's a physics, here's a fundamental, here's applications. It's very close to each other. And often that uh, the, the communication both sides is kind of quite important. Of course, engineers, uh, the one kind of new materials and kind of implementing the applications and then getting to know that what is the new things available into the, uh, uh, the fundamental science area is a kind of very important. But even for the, the scientists the working on the more fundamentals, that uh, the why on this uh, the low dimensional science is possible in the lately is because of this great achievement in appearing the engine. There's a process it can be done. And we always kind of study, for example, my group that try to implement uh, there's a new processing technology so we can just kind of bring for the, the engineers to uh, implement in our device forms to study something new. So I think this kind of connection between science and engineering becomes uh, more and more important and kind of keep interested in each other side of the development is a great thing to happen. Okay, yeah. Also, I think we need to link the chemistry and the physics together. Yeah, many yeah. fabrication was, you know, should get this joined together. Yeah, normally we always think, you know, because I was in microelectronics, all these people think from this very hard part, never feel from the, you know, soft part. Yeah. <laughs> okay, very good. Thank you so much for Philip. Yeah, we're proud of you. You share so many, you know, stories and so many new things. Yeah, uh, use your technology to connect the world and universe. This is for you. Yeah, I hope I next time met you in person. I can deliver this, you know, hard copy to you. But right now, I just sent the electrical version to you. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah.
Thank you very much. And then, okay, yeah. I know it's a very late night there. And thank you very much. <laughs> so I think it's yes, it is. The and now, uh, Miso is already, you know, almost 12 o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you, Miso. Okay. You are my wonderful friends. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you very yeah. much. Yeah, bye -bye. okay, bye. Yeah, this is going to the end of the today. So before, yeah, I uh, close the session, I want to, yeah, deliver next week. We will have a uh, Fangen. Uh, Zeng from uh, Taiwan University, uh, National University of uh, Tsinghua, and uh, we will have uh, Mabudin Roya, who is from University of California and Berkeley. So the, one of them uh, will talk, Fangen will talk about the microbiotics, how to use it to, you know, uh, in the biomedical part. Roya going to talk about the silicon carbide in the harsh environment. So Paul Bass will go to be host the next week's session. We're looking forward to this two one for talks and uh, we also going to have some event next uh, week we will have the graduate school students academically uh, like uh, the last week for this yeah Monday was the fifth yeah PK and uh, so Wednesday was the last PK was the sixth so we have the results uh, announcement of war ceremony and the next Friday before the I can ask tax. So, uh, keep looking for this. And then we're going to have the rising star of light. Yeah, now it's calling for the applications. And this new uh, event was uh, I can ask together with uh, uh, light, the journal, the top journal in uh, phot uh, photonics. So this was a qualification and application uh, uh, selection process. And uh, one more thing, the most important thing, remember to submit your materials before September 15th. So that's a deadline. If you have more information, so want to know, you go visit nature.com, LSA, the journal so they have more details on that yeah please do uh, submit your applications we're waiting for you not only the wonderful you know lectures also we give you some price yeah including you know three thousand dollars for the first prize so be sure you know to connect with this and be sure to listen to i can ask the tax so the next i can ask the rising star for um, ACS nano is september 4th so yeah keep on going you'll see me so so lovely young scientist is the first you know uh ACS nano young rising star yeah he gives she gives the lectures at the first session so the next session we're going to have some new face yeah please join us and uh, we have a bunch of uh, speakers going to get on this stage yeah we are also uh, looking forward to all these wonderful talks uh, that's all for today I can ask the talks the Canadian world and the universe I see you every Friday oh, thank you so much see you Hi. Yeah, so Miso, thank you. Thank you so much. And have a good uh -huh. night. Have a great weekend. Yeah, yeah, I enjoyed it a lot. <laughs> yeah, I enjoyed, I enjoyed it a lot.